I now yield, just in time, uh, five minutes to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate your patience in waiting for me. I got tied up on an important matter, but nothing is more important to me than this hearing. And it's been a, a joy to work with you. This may be our last hearing, but I just wanted to say that I, one thing about the chairwoman is you always know where you stand, and I appreciate that. So, well, right now you're sitting. and now I'm not. I'm probably not standing very well right now. So, um, <clears throat> but I want to thank the Madam Chair for doing this. A hearing welcome, uh, Madam Secretary. Um, First, I want to let you know that uh, uh, the Houston Fusion Center, uh, I had a visit and they wanted connectivity to classified information, SCIF, and you were very responsive uh, in, in fixing that uh, issue, and I want to thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> also, I want to let you know we've heard that INA has significantly improved its interactions both within the department and with state and local fusion centers, and I, I appreciate that. We're all well aware of the problems you inherited at INA, and it does appear, that at least to some extent, that things are improving. I do, however, want to raise a few specific concerns with you. I know you recently had to change your plans for the Joint Fusion Center Program Management Office, and I'm pleased to learn uh, that you're continuing to move forward with that, uh, that goal to coordinate DHS interactions with the fusion centers. In my judgment, this level of coordination is extremely important. Uh, I am concerned, however, that DHS is not paying the same attention to coordinating its interaction with the states as a whole. I have heard reports that different parts of DHS are going to different state offices with threat information, sometimes cutting the fusion centers out of the process altogether. Uh, in my judgment, the department should be the shining example for the rest of the federal government on coordination and information sharing. And I want to be sure that we are not ignoring stovepipes that may be popping up within DHS, particularly when it comes to uh, interactions with state and locals. Additionally, when taking a look at the DHS Intelligence Enterprise Organizational Chart, many DHS elements seem to be missing in, in my judgment. As one example, the Office of Cybersecurity does not appear as part of the Intelligence Enterprise. I hope through this hearing we can explore how the Department defines Homeland Security Intelligence and how you distinguish between partners in the DHS intelligence enterprise and elements who are not, and how you have prioritized INA's customers within the department. Uh, so I look forward to hearing your testimony. Madam Chair, I, I'm aware that there were some scheduling conflicts with today's hearing, so we are unable to hear from the other DHS headquarter elements that we will discuss here today. And while I know Under Secretary Wagner will do a capable job, I want to be sure that we note that we We'll only be hearing from one side, uh, Madam Chair, and I hope that we'll be able to hear from the other parts of the department on this topic in the future uh, so that we can really delve into the problem areas and find solutions. Uh, finally, I've said it before, but I want to reiterate once again that I hope that you will view this as an opportunity for us to discuss the issues, have a constructive conversation, and work together to solve the internal problems at the department. At the end of the day, I know we all want to see it succeed and keeping the American people safe. So in my judgment, DHS needs to get its own house in order before it can hopefully uh, fulfill that mission. Uh, and with that, I yield back. Uh, I thank the ranking member and thank you for your testimony. Um, let me say for the record that other members of the subcommittee uh, um, are uh, permitted to submit opening statements for the record. Uh, none of them is here at the moment, but they can do this at a later time. I thank you uh, for your testimony and just would note <laughs> Every time I hear the words DHS intelligence enterprise, I think of a battleship in a sci-fi movie. A <laughs> um, lot of big words, a lot of huge acronyms. Uh, what we're trying to get at, just to be very clear, is whether you are a leader across these elements in this battleship uh, and, and are able in real time to get critical intelligence to the right folks so that it can be used correctly uh, in time to prevent and disrupt plots. That's what we're after. We're not after memorizing an org chart, and we're not trying to force you to memorize the org chart either. We're trying to be sure that you are in a position to lead on intelligence and analysis issues in the Department of Homeland Security. Are you? Yes, ma'am, I am, and I think people are looking to me to do that. Um, I am trying to lead the intelligence elements of the department to make sure that we're all working together, that we're sharing 
all the information so that every element of the Department is receiving from their Intel support people the same information that they can use in their operational missions. So I would say that I lead the intelligence elements of the Department, but for the other, the operational components and the headquarters elements, I am in a supporting role, which I think is appropriate, making sure that they have the information they need to do their missions. And so it is a, it's a symbiosis. Uh, and I, I think that that is working better, and more, they are more frequently looking to me for that. For that That's what we want to hear. They need to be looking to you. Uh, you need to have a seat at all the, the, the relevant tables, as the jargon goes, and to make certain that you are respected and consulted and have input into other elements of your department that deal with intelligence. Right? Yes, ma'am, and I feel that that is the case. Okay, and we're trying to help you get there because our goal is not to play gotcha. Our goal is to make certain that you are performing at full capacity so that the INA function uh, horizontally is what it needs to be, and we are pleased to see its performance vertically improving now that we have someone with a law enforcement background as your deputy. Right. Okay. Um, I want to ask about two uh, current events and just test you a little bit here. And if we have time, I want to ask you one wonky organizational question. Um, the CyberStorm 3 exercise is being held this week. Is INA contributing intelligence analysts to this exercise? Uh, tell us about how you are doing this and your efforts to address the threat of cybersecurity in coordination with other offices with, within DHS. That is my first question. I will put them both out so you can answer them both. Second. News reports, um, as recent as uh, last night and maybe even today, have made public a terror plot in the U.K. and perhaps in France and Germany in which small teams of, of, of terrorists plan to uh, seize and kill hostages similar to the Mumbai attacks in 2008. How have you or do you propose to work with your partners within DHS headquarters to inform and respond to this new development? On the CyberStorm exercise, I'm actually uh, attending that tomorrow afternoon, uh, which should be really extremely interesting. Um, the analysts that I referred to who are embedded into the uh, NPPD cyber organization have been active participants in developing and implementing this exercise. Um, I and the chief of my cyber analytic branch routinely attend the cyber jam sessions that are hosted by Phil Reidinger who works for Rand Beers, as you know. So I feel that we are uh, extremely integrated uh, into this, and yes, we did participate in developing mm -hmm. this exercise. On item number two, um, I cannot uh, really con confirm anything about what is in the press, which I know will not surprise you because we don't want to uh, compromise or undermine any ongoing intelligence activities. I can assure you that we are actively engaged in monitoring uh, ongoing threat activity, of which there is always uh, a significant amount, and uh, working very closely with other elements of the intelligence community and within the Department and with our foreign allies. Uh, we have instituted, um, just in general, some procedures for ensuring that we are delivering up-to-date intelligence to all members of the headquarters elements. We are now scheduling weekly uh, briefings for all of the key staff elements, in addition to um, having weekly uh, video teleconferences with the components to ensure that we are all on the same page. So I think we, uh, we have taken a lot of steps recently to make sure that everybody is in sync. Well, I appreciate your care in answering that question. I, too, am not revealing anything that I have been briefed uh, in classified setting, but I just said that the, these news reports also say that these so-called storming operations could occur in the United States. That is your turf. And so I just want to be sure you are on it and you are on it. Uh, final question. Why aren't any of the other headquarters elements recognized as critical members of the DHS intelligence enterprise? That is actually a good question, ma'am. Um, I think that they are. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if you're quoting from the 2008 inter, uh, intelligence. Well, that's our last plan. enterprise, yes. the one with Charlie Allen's picture exactly. on it. Exactly. We are uh, in, in the process now of, of completing, actually, and we hope to do so in October, a revised strategic plan 
And um, we actually had this conversation the other day going, well, what's, is it for INA or is it for the enterprise? Or, and my thought process is that since I'm the undersecretary and the SINT, that our strategic plan ought to be both for INA and for the enterprise, and that should include not just the, the components, but also the headquarters elements that we support. So I am going to personally make sure that that is the case when it is completed. But I do view them as part of the enterprise, and in fact, they are some of our most important uh, customers. Well, that is a great uh, I now yield uh, to the ranking member uh, for his question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I think you addressed this in your testimony, but on the vertical information sharing, you know, we, we were just getting some reporting that um, from some of the fusion centers that DHS was going around it and maybe going straight to the State Homeland Security Coordinator. But you, you are aware of that and you have uh, taken action to address that? Yes, we are trying to, to synchronize all of those interactions through our State and Local Program Office. And um, it, there are a lot of ongoing relationships with, with State and Local Governments thus that that, that elements have that have gone back for, for quite some time. So it's, it's, it's well-meaning, uh, and what we, just, we just need to make sure that we are all aware so that we are not coming in at the, at the States from, from multiple different uncoordinated directions. Right. That we are trying to achieve that. I can't claim that we are 100 percent effective yet, but it is steadily improving. Okay. That's, that's good to hear. On the uh, <clears throat> horizontal uh, information sharing side, and I think the last time you testified, we talked a little bit about the National Fusion Center Program Office. And I understand since that time, the appropriators have denied uh, that reprogramming. So I, I was just curious as to what the Department is doing to move forward uh, on that. Actually, I appreciate the opportunity to answer that question. Thanks. And <laughs> um, we, we sort of pitched a concept that was was based on the fact that we had two related but distinct responsibilities to fulfill. Mm -hmm. One was, as you all are terming it, the horizontal uh, sort of relationships within the department, uh, again, addressing your issue, making sure that we, that we are coordinating all departmental interactions with state and local governments through the fusion centers. And that was going to be the Joint Fusion Center Program Management Office. The National Fusion Center Program Management Office was going to address the larger whole of government coordination responsibilities that we were assigned uh, by the White House to include working with the FBI and ONDCP and others. Um, we still have those two functions to fulfill. Um, <clears throat> we understand that the, that the proposal we made looked overly bureaucratic. So what we have done to move ahead is we we've, we've combined those two functions in one office with shared infrastructure. And so it will be a, a, a more streamlined, leaner effort, but we will continue to fulfill both of those sets of responsibilities. And at the moment, it is still being called the State and Local Program Office, which is what it was before. We are exploring uh, with our congressional oversight committees whether we could possibly change the name, um, <coughs> possibly to the National Fusion Center Program Management Office, but we will have those conversations so that we are completely in sync <coughs> with our overseers. What was the, I guess the appropriator's concerns were that it was two different offices and maybe it was duplicative and it was, it was costing too much money. Was that their concern? And so your response is just to put it within one you know, one I, office. I, I do think that that was part of their concern and also I am just not sure that we um, explained it right. uh, completely. Uh, but we have had subsequent conversations with everybody, and I am hoping that we are all in agreement that the way forward we propose makes sense. Okay. I was looking at a, a diagram of the uh, DHS Intelligence Council, and um, one, and I think I mentioned this in my opening statement, one entity that is not in here that I was a little surprised was the, the cyber uh, piece. And, and why is that not included? Uh, in this organizational chart? Probably also a good question. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, our relationship with NPPD tends to focus mostly on infrastructure protection. And so they are, in fact, at the table. And we do occasionally discuss uh, the, the issues, and they uh, basically represent NPPD at the forum. They are welcome also, if there is a cyber-related topic on the agenda, to bring anybody that they would like with them to the HISIC. In fact, we frequently have sort of guest attendees at the HISIC. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I may, in fact, ask that question myself when I okay. get back. So and, and one other entity 
<clears throat> the S and T science and technology had, was is doing threat assessments as well. I saw, and and I don't. Uh, I was kind of curious why they're doing that, and if they are, why aren't they part of this as well? I'm not aware that they're doing threat assessments per se. Okay. Um, okay. And so uh, I may have to, to take that one. You, for the the information I have is that they are. So I, I, you may want you may want to take a look at that. Uh, we work with them to do threat assessments that they put out. They do sort of risk assessments uh, in some areas, and we always provide the threat piece of a larger risk assessment. So if that's, uh, and we do interact uh, with s and and with, and with um, health affairs on those types of risk assessments. So uh, when you, I, I don't think of them as being threat assessments. I think of the thing as being risk, which, as I mentioned okay. before, combines the threat, the vulnerabilities, and the consequences. Okay. So we do participate in those. Um, okay. On infrastructure protection in the private sector, uh, that, that's, and particularly in cyber, the cyber world, that's been very difficult to, you know, the ISACs are out there, the information sharing analysis centers. And can you give me an update on, on where the department is with the uh, sharing of, of critical, uh, you know, information sharing with the private sector for infrastructure protection? Generally speaking, we, we INA partner with infrastructure protection to provide uh, information on critical infrastructure, including cyber infrastructure, to the private sector. And we do a lot of that through the sector coordinating councils and other existing uh, mechanisms, such as the, the evolving uh, DSAC, the, Dem the Domestic Security Advisory Council. Um, we also do a lot of tabletop exercises and kinds of, of activities with the private sector to try to help them uh, understand the nature of the threat and terrorist uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures to help them work through some of these issues. And we've, we've recently done uh, one with the hotel industry. In fact, I think we did two, and I put a product out on that topic as well. So basically, again, we team with infrastructure protection to provide the, the threat and vulnerability information, and then we get the information out either through uh, written products, uh, conferences, uh, tele telephone conferences, or some of the, these exercises that we run and invite key representatives of the various sectors. But I guess, is there a two-way uh, flow of threat information between DHS and the private sector and vice versa? I, I think the answer to that is yes, although the, the flow back to DHS, I think, is, is less developed um, as it is sort of across the board. Uh, we're working with the FBI on this, uh, the Suspicious Activity Reporting Initiative, which I'm sure you're aware of, mm -hmm. which would also pertain uh, to private sector and, in fact, the public uh, at large. And so we are hoping to get more information as that becomes more socialized. But yes, we do get information. Yeah, and so what are, what are some of the obstacles you see uh, that uh, prohibit or discourage the private sector from sharing this information with you? Yeah. Uh, I think probably the fact the private sector is just so large that <laughs> there, I will frequently hear from people, well, the private sector is saying you don't share anything with them. We actually we are trying to increase our level of interaction with the private sector, but it is so huge that you are still uh, unfortunately impacting only a small percentage. And I think part of, the, part of the real challenge is just educating them on what we can do and making sure that they know where to come into uh, the enterprise, if you will, if they have information. They are always free to go to their, fusion, to their <coughs> local fusion center, mm. directly to the JTTF with terrorism information, mm. but we also need to, to make it clear that there are other avenues for them as well and educate them. So I think that's just the, the sheer magnitude of, of building that relationship is the challenge. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, if you know, uh, I appreciate the fact that the minority ranking uh, member and, and uh, works closely with me on these things, and I don't think we've had a disagreement about the course or agenda of this subcommittee, not even one. Uh, let me yield to him for a final thought or observation or question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I've, I've also appreciated our close working relationship. And, and uh, uh, you know, and this is a little bit off topic for this hearing, but since we have you, held hostage for at least 30 minutes. I want to throw that. I'm becoming increasingly more concerned about um, not so much about command and control, Al Qaeda, or, you know, the threat coming from there, but um, 
more of these sort of franchise operations. But, but even more so, we had a couple of hearings on this, and I appreciate the Madam Chair for doing it, on Internet radicalization. And I'm becoming more and more concerned about the disenfranchised, you know, uh, Muslims or even some non-Muslims, people getting on the Internet, listening to someone like El Laki, um, or talking to him like Mr. Hassan did, and, and suddenly uh, radicalizing, and then we have an act of terrorism. Can you, can you touch that at all, or discuss if you see that threat becoming increasingly more of a threat? I, I think we are concerned that that is becoming more of a threat, and the intelligence community uh, is focused on, on what more can we do to understand the process of radicalization uh, in order to, to do really two things, uh, to help uh, law enforcement in our communities identify and possibly, you know, interrupt that process, and also to um, to advise the policy community on what types of engagement or, inter or policy interventions might actually be uh, effective. And in the wake of the Christmas Day bombing, the uh, ODNI <coughs> tasked my office to lead an interagency effort with FBI and NCTC to try to improve our analytic understanding of this problem. And since the last time I spoke to you, we developed and coordinated an action plan with the community. We did receive some money from the DNI to do this, and we have uh, worked on a series of case studies for some of the people that have, that have been radicalized and performed violent acts that we are um, now going out and discussing with our partners in the fusion centers and our state and local law enforcement folks to say, okay, here's what we found out. Um, is this useful to you? What more can you add, particularly uh, in areas where uh, there may be communities about which the local law enforcement people know a lot and can give us information. We are also uh, working closely with um, our allies who <clears throat> experience some of these problems to ensure that we understand what their best practices are, both analytically and in things like community uh, policing, those kinds of issues. And obviously with the uh, with academia uh, as well, because it, it's, this is partially an intelligence problem and partially a human behavior problem. And it is, uh, I don't want to minimize the difficulty of understanding why some people um, who are radical or have extremist views, and that's not illegal, uh, uh, take that next step and go uh, in, in, into violent uh, manifestations of those views. Difficult to predict um, and very difficult to predict if they're sitting in their basement on the Internet. Uh, well, and one, so one of the magazines, I think, was it Inspire? Or what was Inspire. It? You know, they had How to Make a Bomb in Your Mom's Kitchen. And, and, right. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I showed to a group back home uh, a, a video of um, El Waki that I think was, is on the Internet. And they weren't as concerned with him as much as they were the, the rap video that was very disturbing that is a clear effort to recruit in, in sort of a totally different way uh, that's trying to cater to maybe a, a right. younger audience and trying to, you know, it's sort of a hip-hop rap type video. And, there's clearly an effort to reach out in ways that are, you know, consistent with pop culture and that will appeal to people, you know, of a certain age and background. So that is a, is a concerning development. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're working on this, but it, it's a difficult problem. Thank you.